On Friday, February 24th, the Society for the Performance of Contemporary Music will present a concert of works by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. It will be held at the San Francisco Museum of Art at 8 p.m. Last month, some members of the Society visited Mr. Stockhausen at his Sausalito apartment and asked him questions concerning his views on music and the specific pieces to be played on the 24th, namely, Contacta for piano, percussion, and tape to be heard for the first time in San Francisco, Microphony 1, a new electronic work, and refrain for three players. Uh, Mr. Stockhausen, some of the most exciting music being written today leaves a large part of the audience baffled, uh, not knowing how to listen to it or what to listen for. I'm sure you've had this experience with your listeners, and we've certainly had it many times. How do you account for this gap between the composer's intentions and the listener's reaction? And uh, more specifically, how would you personally like people to react to your music, what would you like to get across to them? What you describe is very positive. It shows that uh, some of the music of our day is really discovering new realms of experience. That uh, this music proves there is something of the unknown that uh, is being opened by the work of composers. And if the people are invited to participate at musical concerts, when they are confronted with the results of these discoveries and new inventions in musical terms, then it is quite natural that uh, what they hear is new for them and they are unfamiliar with, with this kind of experience because they actually discover by using the music a part of themselves that has been unknown to them and they have been unaware of, of this part of their personality. So many people are surprised or even astonished or offended sometimes. These are very positive signs. You wouldn't conclude from that that strangeness or exoticness is uh, an end in itself for a composer. Well, it's also part, always part of important discoveries. It has always been in, in the history of music and of all spiritual activity. How about uh, getting more personal? Uh, what do you expect? Uh, your listeners' reaction to be ideally, uh, what do you expect to do to him? Uh, what might happen to him inwardly as he's listening to your music? Well, first of all, that uh, he is curious, that he really likes to live in such a, a fantastically uh, imaginative and open time like we do nowadays and that he likes to participate in the new discoveries. <clears throat> Besides this openness, um, that he understands more and more that music as well as other art experiences and experiences in the field of sciences, of uh, philosophy, religion, are mainly um, no instruction. There is no specific message. There is no specific information that they have to understand, but that they more and more understand that all these things are there for the individual, that uh, each individual is supposed to make sense out of these experiences in a very personal way. Most of the listeners from the traditional way of, of training still believe that they have to understand something very, something special and that this would be the same for everybody. Though as if the art were a kind of propaganda or a kind of, of general information. But uh, 
understand more and more that an artistic experience for everybody who participates in it is just a, a chance to discover oneself. And I think the music should be used by the people in a very individual way. What kind of discoveries might one make about oneself in listening? Of course, as you well, say, this is an individual matter. Well, to think, to feel, and to do things that you have never done before. Would you say that, that your music uh, corresponds um, more to the, the unconscious levels of a person's experience than music of the past? Well, as far as many things that are going on in, in the new music, we cannot verbalize. Um, the intellectual activity very often cannot work in the usual way. We cannot name what, what we experience. We cannot uh, talk about it in a preformed language. That's uh, why perhaps what you call the unconscious, I would say, is the, the very musical experience. We cannot uh, put it into words. Seems to me that music education ill prepares people for this kind of experience. Well, everything is intellectualized nowadays, yeah. and most of the people think what they cannot talk about doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is really true that uh, the most important experiences we have uh, go beyond mm -hmm. our capability of intellectualizing it or, and nailing it down in words. And, and uh, speak about it in a way that we could translate it, so to speak, in language. It's probably always been so with new art. I think so. There's nothing special. Only in nowadays, the <coughs> outburst uh, of, of uh, completely new uh, experiences uh, are, it, it's so strong that we, from all we know from historical documents, that we may say our time is especially renewing the whole human way of living and thinking and experience. Do you think if, if your music were to become widely, uh, that is, widely appreciated by, by a mass public, that it would have some kind of um, moral impact that would change the, the, the nature of their thinking, the nature of their experience? Well, the number of the people participate in a specific kind of art is of no importance. I don't expect that uh, everybody uh, is able to make sense out of my music or of anybody else. There are always groups of human beings that are more interested in, in certain things and less interested in other things. And I would say the more the art goes away from the typical patterns of entertainment, that means just feeding the public with certain a, a kind of amusement that fills their empty time. As soon as, as the, the art uh, goes away from that and just exists, because the artists are convinced that they constantly discover bit by bit something of the unknown, no matter how many people are interested in it or are willing to participate in it. Well, under these conditions, uh, a minority is quite natural. And the more concentrated and the, the more uh, truthful the, the activity of an artist, is 
the more you must count the fact that very few people uh, are at this very moment already dealing with the same kind of, of uh, openness and curiosity. And On the other hand, you have connected two questions. And the second one, I would say, as soon as someone listens to my music, or any other composer who is really uh, concentrating on similar experiences, as soon as someone listens to it, everything important has already happened. That means the sound actually, the waves of the air are organized in a specific way when I compose a, a musical work and this work is performed and when the listener listens to it, then this structure of waves goes electrically through his structure. His, his electric structure, every human being in is a highly differentiated electric structure. The whole nervous system and psychophysiological system. And in this very moment, the waves being structured in a specific way run through his whole system. So there may be many doors closed in some people, like electric switches that haven't been turned on. And then the waves go forth and back and forth and back and cannot run through the system smoothly. There are many feedbacks. And sometimes few systems blow out. And then the people get nervous or angry even, or they, they turn away from this kind of experience. And in some cases, we can't do anything about it because even physiologically, certain strata in this electric system have been uh, used many times through the music that they have exposed themselves to throughout many years, through many years, or literature, or, or daily experiences, whatever it is. So certain people are already old. That means simply that their system is, has become an established system, which is the, the closed system. It doesn't change anymore. And they don't expose themselves, even in their life, to a stronger change anymore. Everything is settled. That means also, when they are in an artistic experience, which demands openness, and that the switches are really all the switches are turned on so that the, the waves can run through the whole system. And switches right. turned on meaning not necessarily that they're thinking at, at a great pace, but that they're simply all also, open. To also, the well, yes, but this all, the, the thinking goes in that way. You see, thinking means in these terms um, getting away from pre-established patterns mm -hmm. or using them just as much as they can be useful. Um, so the thinking process may help sometimes. And sometimes very old people are extremely young and very young people are extremely old. This is quite uh, quite the case. So they may, well, I don't need to go into details about all this. That means finally, when the structure of a music goes into the air, the air waves uh, are transmitted to the ear, and this then goes into the electric system of the human being. Then the whole system of that human being becomes modulated, more or less, and it will leave a trace forever if a certain if one has been exposed to a certain kind of music, and if one sticks to a certain type of music of a certain time, a certain time of a certain composer or a certain type, let's say rock and roll music, then your whole system one more and more becomes modulated with the structure of this music. And if you do this too much, then you get come get out of balance. Um, you become specialized, your system becomes specialized. It responds more to this kind than to another kind. That's what we call finally self-education, eliminating certain things in life. 
So if people are confronted with the kind of music I write and they have really been, they are specialists for other music, for other periods of history of other types, then they may run into trouble. Because uh, though their, their system is modulated, but there are many, uh, then many contradictions in the differences. Here you see the, 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 the synapses and the, and the, the brain uh, don't open. And then this makes really uh, highly critical. What you're no, saying no, nervous situation. Uh, what you're saying about how music affects a person's system, uh, uh, it calls to mind, uh, <coughs> and Chris Lance was talking about coming up here, about the, uh, the, the, the effect of... The question is the effect of uh, the outside bombardment of sound right. we are continuously being presented with. Right. Of the new in history. Well, even Musak does this in every restaurant, and people right. say, well, I don't listen anymore, that's not true. They are not conscious of it anymore, that means it goes already automatically into the system, which is even worse. Would you call this so? Would, would you call this oh. illness? Uh, I mean, uh, a social illness that is similar to a disease in which they can no longer respond to well, the stimulus. Well, we are always exposed exposed to certain things, and I wouldn't say that this is an illness because this automatically happens. You see, all especially in this country, we are surrounded and, as you call it, bombarded by all kinds of advertisements, which is nothing else. And the people, specialists in advertising, know exactly that the best results you get that the people are not aware of this. And uh, the whole post 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 theory, for example, in, in Europe is based on that principle. How to make a poster that you are not aware of. Or, for example, the, the new tendencies in cinemas is to make the Coca-Cola advertising so short that the people haven't seen it consciously, but then they walk out and 40% and, uh, uh, more selling is done in, in this particular kind of, of thing. Well, they, everybody knows that. And we can't, uh, we can't get away from it because it's, it's in the air all the time. Do you think that this um, in some way spoils people for music for, for a very sensitive tuning in to a, a new experience in music. Well, we have, like the, yes, we have come on such a general kind of, of discussion. I would say that the humanity is still very young in using these fantastically powerful new means of, of uh, uh, information at the, all the advertising. Uh, procedures and uh, television and radio and all the graphic advertisements in the city advertisements that we still don't know how to use it right. I think humanity will come uh, after a time of critical, really critical transition where much damage is done to many people to using all these media much more careful and much more with individual choice. For example, when I make radio programs in Germany, I, in, I consistently tell the people, please turn off your knob. You have that chance now. Mm -hmm. And don't blame me afterwards that you don't like this kind of music that I'm going to broadcast. <coughs> you are, have become perhaps familiar with it once in a while. You know who I am, what kind of job I do when I make these programs. Please just switch to the second program and you will have this kind of music, and I tell them what's going on, or read the radio papers, and I know that when you go in a house in Germany, in any private house, right when you come into the house, on a little cupboard, you see immediately the radio newspaper, the radio paper for the week, and you see many red and blue pencil strokes in it, and where they have made the choice, and they use these things already much more consciously, and they just not let it go all the time. As well as the same thing with television, I have I have uh, recognized in this country that people don't know how to use television at all. Of course, there's so, some question how much choice they have available to them. Uh, well, but nevertheless, they let it go all the time, for example, and then they expose themselves to all sorts of of, of, of mixed job information, and uh, they become completely a slave of these. 
the pain, they can't get away from it. Because it's still so new, it's like children who, who have new toys. Well, they, they become for some time completely slaves of, of these toys until they use them care more carefully like adults would, should do. Well, in this very case, uh, they should use magnetics the same way. Not, not at the wrong time when they're tired. Not, not, not uh, when they come from business and just rush into a, a concert and uh, then really uh, either they are very active creators, participating, or they don't get anything out of it and just disturb because the music is just not uh, this kind of uh, smoothing and uh, and uh, uh, so, so it's like psychedelic track to, to make them quiet or to make them unconscious, etc., etc. If they don't participate very actively and, and are aware that this is the result of a real art, art discovery, research of, of, of uh, new realms of human activity, and that it demands high creativity also from the part of the of the participant, that I don't consider him being just a passive consumer, which is a, is a terrible thing for me, that I would uh, be, so to speak, the master or, or the, the ceremony master or the clown who has to to, to do some, some things for them, to amuse them. They have some things to do themselves. They... Well, that's what I do too. I mean, I, I just put myself fully in every experience, so otherwise when I'm not able, I go away and I'm calm and I, I relax. I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, listen all the time, only a very short time. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. Uh, turning to your music, um, many people mistakenly identify you solely with electronic music. Uh, this concert that SBCN is going to present should give the lie to that idea because we have two pieces there where... Well, you know, I have written just to know, I don't know exactly, I, I think something like 23 or 24 published scores and works. And only, let me see, one, two, three, four, Five are entirely electronic, and three others use electronic means together with musicians performing, and together as a simultaneous they use when the musicians are performing, transforming what they are playing. That means eight works out of twenty-four. Yes, uh, only deal with uh, electronic means. Refrain the first piece uh, of. This concert is uh, entirely for live performers. Try to be like the performance to uh, perform with Graham. So often in uh, Western music, you can uh, sit and wait for the next event to happen. After one event has happened, you never follow it out completely. You always go shooting uh, right on to the next event. But so often the refrain has a chance to follow up the natural diminution of the stress. And the piano, the mm -hmm. but it's, it's one score where I started more and more concentrating on the listening process itself, giving all the necessary um, qualities for the continuity. You, you see, usually time was measured either with the clock, mm -hmm. metronome as another kind of clock, or with counting process, a kind of a mechanical process. Or let's say even in, in some of the more advanced music with optical signs, one musician would give a cue to another one, or a conductor would give a cue. Whereas in the refrain, I started to concentrate on what I call the sound sign, the sound time, mm -hmm. the time that's given by the sound itself that you produce, and uh, the sound time is given by the dynamic with which you attack the sound. So that actually duration and dynamic are completely related. And timbre as well and pitch, because if you, for example, hit the sound in the higher register, then it will be shorter. And, uh, and vice versa, in the lower one, it will be longer. So then the duration changes, the dynamic changes. And if you hit a chord, for example, then only one of those 
sounds of this very chord gives the duration, and one has to listen very carefully to one part of an of an entity. That's a good thing. Perhaps I, I should explain for those who don't know the, the piece that the uh, performers are given uh, instructions to, to wait until the previous sound has decayed. Has, uh, it dies away to, first, uh, to a certain uh, degree, not totally. Sometimes, Sometimes just one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, and you have to estimate while you're listening how much you think now the volume has decreased so that you then give the the beginning cue for the next attack. Very intimate relationship between the nature of the sound and the time. Uh, right. Oh, well, continue. for the players, that's the main thing. The, the three players, when I perform, we perform many times, and we have had this marvelous experience with our little piece, that we have become one, actually, the, the three players. We were like one body, because it is so fantastically uh, a strong in the, in the interrelation between the three players with the eye and the ears. Right? And we become really one ear. It's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen this happen. Uh, Don has performed this piece with two other SPCN members mm -hmm. several times. And I've seen it happen to them. They performed it out in Arms and Saints and Oh, years ago. And they had this exactly that same experience. And the strange thing with that thing is it never gets old for the performers, and therefore I think this this uh, goes across across to the public too, because uh, whenever you have another chilasta, or for example, we sometimes ran into places where we had no real chilasta, but a little keyboard glockenspiel, and so there I had to play the chilasta part with the left hand on the piano, on the piano keyboard with the right hand, and way up. Uh, a foot higher or even more on the little keyboard instrument. Well, the, 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 the resonances of the instruments were so different from place to place. And then how to play together with the vibraphones, that's especially a problem if you have a good, uh, let's say, a travel, a Deegan traveler vibraphone that gives rather equal length of each uh, metal plate for all three artists. Whereas when you have other vibraphones, Certain sounds died away earlier, and you are really listening to your instrument, and uh, you are trying to find something out that very night of the performance. You don't put out a completely prepared thing like you did, like an organ, <coughs> which has then become almost a mechanical uh, thing to to execute, as we say. It's one really has to perform and do the literary sense of the word. Another aspect of this is the uh, performer's choice and the position of the refrain. Well, we work out all this one version. We write it out, and then we, we have a bicycle to travel anymore. We have to play, let's say, for one tour, when we make a tour of 20 countries, something like that, then we play all this one version. Mm -hmm. and then for another tour, we make another version. But uh, we don't want to get bothered with the reading part. We want to listen all the time, not think anymore. Think, I mean, think about what note to play. That's of no importance. Contact, the uh, second piece on the program, uh, has a, a fascinating dialogue between tape sounds, electronic <coughs> sounds, and uh, two live players. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, it, it seems fairly obvious, though, maybe I'm wrong, that the title of the piece, Contact, comes from this very fact of the contact between the electronic Well, that's one of the meanings, yes. Well, certainly, there are more meanings. Or many more. You see, this implicates the way the fact, the very fact that what the players play is known to them. They play percussion instruments on piano. And if also the pianist has percussion instruments, as you know. Well, we can identify the sound because we see, first of all, what they do. And then uh, also we know, even if there are some unusual instruments to use. Uh, we know what kind of sound it is. It is a known sound world, like traffic signs. Like traffic signs where? In an, in an unknown world. Because whenever then I transform a known sound, let's say a cowbell sound, um, continuously into a sound that we cannot name, we have no names for, electronic, with electronic sounds. Well then, the known sound world becomes related to the unknown and 
There is a contact between the known and the unknown at very many different degrees, and this is another meaning of it. And uh, that's why I say the traffic signs. So, because they are the points of reference in a world where you don't know what, mm -hmm. what the marvelous, sounds are. Marvelous sections in there where there are, oh, I think, marimba sounds. Uh, it, from or the other sound, all of a sudden, gets, a, gets a, 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 an E flat. <coughs> Which has been in the air with a very unknown timbre, and all of a sudden the piano starts identifies it for a little moment, mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. moment, then you go away from it again. And just, mm -hmm. Well, I worked with these <coughs> these degrees of, of 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 approximation or something known very carefully, mm -hmm. and then there is a, a a third meaning which is as important to me as the two others. That is, the original performance always is done with the a four four channel projection of the sound. Mm -hmm. So the sounds are surrounding the public really and there are lots of rotations going on mm -hmm. which in a in a, a two channel performance like you are yeah. probably doing it are reduced to a two dimensional mm -hmm. uh, so to speak ping pong kind of, of relationship left right. But this is is um, in the original is when we perform it in Europe it's always a in a complete circle of sound, and then there are rotations going on with different speed and alternation at the same time, sometimes to propose two or three different types of movement of sound with different speeds and different directions, left wise, right wise, or from from opposite angles of the of the hall, you have the dialogue, you know, to two dialogues going on at the same time, etc. Well, there I consciously work with contacts of movement and of speed of sound. And, and I call uh, I call them even uh, movement forms. Like I would I speak of chords and harmonies of space movement. When you say contacts of movements of uh, do you mean literally that, that a certain sound will meet another sound at a certain location. Yeah, a rotation with an alternation, for example. A rotation which has, let's say, three 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 revolutions per, per second and slows down continuously mm -hmm. in during half a minute and then at a certain moment an alternation starts with an actual window and then these two movements all of a sudden uh, meet meet and have a kind of, of polyphony and contact. Mm -hmm. Um there's a very dramatic moment in the <coughs> middle, exactly in the middle of a piece where the electronic sound and the players converge upon a single note, an E, I think it is. Oh, that E flat, I see what you mean, yes. Oh, where this is, the piano, yes, where the thing goes down to my eyes. Yeah, yes. That has, I've heard the piece now three times in live performance, and that has always seemed to me to be a crucial moment of the piece. Well, that's the nucleus of the whole of the whole way I have composed it, because it shows you something very important. What happens all the time, but I haven't made it so obvious, except of at this very moment, that is the following, that all the sounds are the result of rhythms that I have composed only in such high speed that we don't hear the rhythms, but that we perceive these very fast rhythms, I mean, they are fast, like a thousand periods in a time, in a second. Mm -hmm. and then it makes a, 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 a sound which has a certain pitch, which being the result of a thousand periods per second. But the inner rhythm in each period determine, determines the, the timbre of the sound. And I have made all the sounds by speeding up the rhythm. Uh, very, very fast. So, and in this very moment, uh, the following happens. I have, just before it happens, a continuous sound, a pitch of 166 bucks per second, I think about, which uh, comes out of a very dense uh, cra uh, crowd, or how can I say, it's a collective of, of a mass of sound. Mm -hmm. And this thing was, the pitch comes out, and then it goes in. in uh, the sun curve, it goes down six and a half octaves. That means if you go down six and a half octaves from 166 seconds per second, then you cross the border 
where our perception uh, transforms uh, the acoustic experience, we first perceive it as a pitch going down, and then it breaks down. The sound breaks literally down into its components. To individual beats. And you hear the beats, the rhythm, all of a sudden. And then this rhythm again, what what formerly of this continuous sound of 166 cycles per second was its standard, that means still faster frequency relationship. The over Way up, yeah, the overtone, so to speak. They go also down naturally parallel with that sound six octaves, and then they become the pitch. Mm -hmm. And what has been the pitch before now is the rhythm. Ah. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this bad moment, I continuously make longer and longer these sounds. Jam, 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 wah, and I have again a continuous sound. Mm -hmm. So that means what was continuous before, I break down these components and it becomes continuous again under completely different circumstances. This continuous sound then, <coughs> I filter it more and more in higher frequency ranges, continuously going upward, so that I let completely disappear that continuous sound. It becomes a noise, and at the end it's just a hiss again. It disappears through the chamber. So. It's an amazing kind of uh, field theory of music that, that pitch and rhythm are so intimately related that well, they can't be they separated. That, that well, pitch is simply so many events per second. Well, our perception mm -hmm. makes the qualities out of all these quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. like we have a microscopy, for example. If we take a, a microscope, all of a sudden we become aware of the components of an object that seems to be solid. Mm -hmm. So we recently the composer who began to use this total field. Well, I don't know if any other composer did it up to now. I don't Do you know? So. I don't think so. This has a, a this raises some question about how uh, people are to experience what what you're doing. That is, for instance, if I you're, you're talking you. about a thousand beats per second, yeah. this is something that, that the ear certainly can't. Uh, define. I mean, the ear can't say, "Oh, I'm hearing now." A thousand well, we say that it is a C between uh, yes. B, <laughs> B and C in the third octave uh, from the middle key on, or the second octave from from the middle uh, middle C on upward. Yeah. That's what. So that's our right. identification. Yeah. Certainly, we can. But if you're talking about rhythm. The rhythm. Well, our name for this rhythm is the C. Yes, it's just a question of terminology. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. um, we, but we perceive it. It, it seems as if um, refrain marked a, a, a major change in style in, in your writing. Do you think that's so? It seems that what you were doing before that was more related to distantly to the 12 tone uh, writers. Technique no, I don't think in these terms that this that is true because I have used already some very first words on contrapuntal terms of certain uh, um, methods of structuring music which were not serial according to what has come to us traditionally from Schindler and Bibbon. For example, I have massive sounds in certain parts where I don't at all organize the elements according to uh, to row composition. Already in the very first one, uh, <coughs> I have completely different different methods of uh, organizing collective sounds. And uh, but what in refrain has happened actually is something else. I have consciously. Enlarge the, the dimensions of short and long, and uh, the relationships of of of, of uh, the different qualities like dynamics and duration and harmony and rhythm. There is such a firm interpenetration and interrelationship between the different aspects that one can't separate anymore. Or and, and for example, long, what I mean, uh, enlarged the dimension is that I have consciously uh, used more and more longer duration or 
static node or um, um, long time to, to, to sound to sound to 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 silent relationship that increasingly uh, is is bound more and more since this work to find uh, the quality of rights of speak of sound and silence in, in composition. And I'm more consciously working with these relationships, how much of both I would use. And on the other hand, there is something uh, interesting to me that I, since then, it has really happened in groups and in, in the site master, but, but it, since then, very consciously, I increased more and more the density of sound, of a map of sound, uh, that, uh, that are con considered being one unity. Uh, no, no longer a group of, of no, of, of single, no, tones. Well, for example, that 200 sounds would make one, like the leaves of a tree. And uh, that uh, I consciously go beyond the limits of, of analyzing uh, a musical event in terms of being the sum of elements. My quality is, is a uh, piece that's <coughs> very new and, and unfamiliar to uh, most of us. Uh, I wonder if you'd uh, describe it, perhaps start with the meaning of the title. Well, uh, it comes from microphone. And microphone is the process of using uh, microphone, microphonic uh, enlargement of, of ways that are too small that to, to be to be heard normally, like the same thing what we do with microscopia. So microphonia means microphony, the process of microphony means that uh, for the first time I had the uh, like I had used the microphone as a musical instrument. The, the microphone specific the special microphone is moved by hand, by performance to microphones actually. On the surface, in that variety of a, of a huge tam tam. The tam tam is, is uh, put into vibration by two other musicians according to the score, and the microphone is, is moved according to indications of the score, like you would uh, move the bow of a violin. Mm -hmm. Only here it has uh, the function that when you use actively and not just passively, pro productively and not just reproductively, a microphone, then the movements of the micro microphone naturally modulate, transform the way that I think that if I do it with a certain rhythm, for example, it may be periodic but more or less aperiodic, it may be close, very close to the surface or at a certain distance. And I may approach the tam tam with a certain speed, etc. This all transforms all musical qualities. That means I superimpose on the on the primary rhythm, I superimpose the second rhythm with the movement of the of the of the microphone. And then being very close to the point of excitement or further away makes the sound more or less uh, reverberated. The sound is more or less far away. When I hear, well, when I hear it, I must explain immediately that it was picked up through the microphone, go through electronic equipment, through filters, again, the disturbed layer of organization, and then it's fed into loudspeakers. And so that the, the transformed sounds are heard simultaneously without any delay with the original sound and, and blend with the original sound. That means we have now, in the process as I described it, uh, a polyphony of three uh, related, organized forces. The first force is the production of the sound, done by two musicians. The second one is the mic microphonic transformation of the sound by the action of using the microphone as an active tool. And the third force is the electronic transformation of the sound by using electric filters, electric filters, that means filtering out or uh, uh, boosting certain uh, 
span of the, of the waves that are picked up by microphones, and each of these players of the third group has potential meters uh, articulating the, the value again of the sound waves that are picked up by the microphones and fed to the filters. That we have now three musical musical areas that uh, articulate the sound more or less relate more or less. I mean, they may be in a polyphonic superimposition. The first one may do it very periodically, the second one may do syncopation in relation to the first, and the third one may superimpose a real polyphonic third layer rhythmically and uh, dynamically. You get a very yeah. complex uh, effect with a very simple. Uh, right, that's what I would really want <coughs> is that the inner of the sound is really articulate in the polyphonic way. Yeah. To, to really to to put the polyphonic approach into the microstructure of the way. That's what I want. And on the other hand, naturally, it has an aesthetic quality, which is very important to me. That this very piece, for example, uses the tan tan, which was standing in my garden for years. And what I always would approach, go close to the tan tan, I would scratch on it or take a spoon and hit on it, and put the mic up here very close to the surface, and I would hear incredible things. That nobody would hear from a three foot distance. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I thought, if I could amplify this and, and articulate this whole process, then I would compose rather the process of how to make sounds become audible instead of composing the specific music. You see, I, I wouldn't have sound images so much, but I would concentrate on the process of how to make the micro world, <coughs> the micro world, coming close to our ears. As if, let's say, a painter would not paint an object or make an object, but uh, he would com compose a process how to use uh, optical material, amplification material, like uh, microscopes and uh, all this kind of thing, to, to see things. He would compose this process how to, to look at things instead of um, composing the objects that are to be looked at. It's a fascinating idea. It's very new, I think. Um, do you feel that, that your music grew naturally <clears throat> out of the past, or do you think it represents a radical break with the past? Do you think it represents the beginning of a whole new era in, in music, comparable, say, to the well, if you ask me what I feel, then uh, I could not be more burdened than with what, what the past has, has put on my neck. That means I, I never could escape from the or, organic growth of uh, musical history and uh, human activity. Uh, I couldn't think of anything that had not been partially prepared by what has happened before. Uh, a complete break, I think, is almost impossible, even if it sometimes seems to be at a very close perspective <coughs> that we break continuity. After a short while, we become aware of all the preconditions and all the circumstances that have brought it out naturally, quite naturally. And I think uh, tradition is, is uh, something that we constantly create ourselves. It is only a question of definition. What I do tomorrow, today, tomorrow morning will be already tradition. And uh, it will condition everything that anybody else does to get me in touch with musical composition. And if he doesn't know that, uh, that's his fault. He should know. Just one more question before we close here. Uh, how do you recommend that uh, people listen to electronic composition for the concert hall? I think it's designed during England. Do you prefer that the lights be out and that you're at a sense of being excited? Yeah, but you see, I usually say, um, I describe what I do when I listen to music that's only reproduced to means of speech that I close my eyes because I feel that uh, I become much more free innerly to uh, connect my my 
vision of uh, uh, forces was the acoustical experience. So I see all sorts of things naturally. They, though they may be uh, abstract, I couldn't describe most of them in terms of us. What kind of objects that are there are floating around in an incredible space and, and hitting each other and, and superimposed and going with all speed, like you sometimes have in abstract dreams where there are no space and time limits. You, you can make jumps of, of miles from mountain to mountain. You know, that will all happen with the inner senses when you listen to this kind of music and you are not related to the walls or to the chairs and to the objects. So the space becomes the real musical space as soon as you get away from the visual space limits. And uh, this is then the real musical space. And if it would be possible to have the, the, the lights shut off without that, people come into these typical reactions that sometimes happen in cinema when it is completely dark or in situations where you suddenly shut off the lights, people get a kind of a frightened frightened feeling because they are not used to it. And then there's this is a strange kind of psychological situation. It comes from a certain visual orientation which we had in modern society. We which is so dominating. If we can't see where we are, why uh, we feel we need to tear it and do it. Right. Well, but I recommend really that we should go more and more when we have music only through speakers into the experiences of of getting away from the visual, if there is nothing composed of any relevance uh -huh. in the visual realm. In this line, do you, do you think the structure of the normal concert hall uh, might be a, a change? That is, the fact that people are all facing forward necessarily. Well, this I already recommend for the music that is performed in concert halls. We should have music houses that have very specific kinds of of uh, architecture of many rooms where we can even walk from room to room and have different kinds of experiences in each room and the rooms are related to each other. But I would also recommend that we compose music for uh, I mean music for such music houses where music is going on in different rooms at the same time. And I mean this a composition which which happens in, in different rooms. The like listener would walk from room to room right. to be part of the experience. Right, so that you can discover part of the piece, so to speak, in a, in a given room, and then three layers of that very, of that same piece in another room. Mm -hmm. And then in one hall, you may have everything together, as it were. Uh, well, this is not only the case for, for uh, music which is only to be heard, because I think that there will be all, in a pluralistic way, all kind of mixtures between what we see and hear, and um, I don't recommend that we go in a, in a one-dimensional development only having music to listen to, or only having things to look at, but all kinds of mixtures and also music which is only to be heard and where the visual has no role, no importance. In, in this uh, line of mixtures, uh, are, are you personally interested in the kind of uh, written in drama that some composers are working Theater. with now? Yes, theater pieces. Oh, yeah, I, I certainly will, will compose uh, compositions and I'm actually working on one of this very moment where what you see in theater is, is really very much related in a new sense. And, uh, it would be something completely different than what we think is Theater is, or what what is supposed to happen you know, visually. Uh, it is uh, well. It, certainly, I think that I have to do that, but I can't do it. I, I feel I can't do it. Oh, thank you very much.